Managing user access to your Kubernetes clusters can be a bit of a hassle. This is because granting access by manually creating, maintaining, and distributing service account tokens can become very tedious very quickly, especially if you have members leaving and joining the team on a regular basis. So if your team is sizable, implementing a dynamic authentication system that facilitates authentication via an identity provider is a good practice. Now, Kicklock is one such identity provider, and in this video, we will see how to install and configure it to grant access to our Kubernetes clusters. We will also see how to audit Kube API server requests so that we can know what actions are being performed in our clusters. Kicklock is an open source identity and access management solution. It can be used to provide authentication as well as authorization if you need it to any of your applications that support single sign-on. It supports standard protocols like SAML and OpenID Connect, which is supported by the Kubernetes API server. So let us get an instance of Kicklock running in our cluster. You will need first to create a certificate for Kicklock since the Kube API server will communicate with external services only if they use HTTPS. You may create the certificate using any method that you prefer, as long as you set the correct common name and DNS names for the certificate. If you have SAT Manager installed in your cluster, you can create a self-signed cluster issuer, which we can now use to create our root certificate authority. We can then create an issuer that will use this same certificate authority to sign our certificates in the Kicklock namespace. Then, using the new issuer, we can create the certificate for our Kicklock server. In the certificate manifest, we set the secret name where the generated certificates will be stored. We also set the common name and the DNS names and the issuer that we just created under the issuer ref. After we apply the certificate manifest, we can verify that the certificate is ready and that the secret with the SAT data also exists. So now we can install Kicklock using Helm and configure it to use the certificate we just generated. We will use the Kicklock provided in the Bitnami Helm repository, so make sure you have added it in your list of repos. We'll need to make a few changes to the default configuration, so to do that we'll set some custom values in a values file. Here we create an admin user under auth and then we enable TLS and set auto generated to true so that Kicklock can generate its own internal TLS certificates. Then under ingress, we make sure ingress is enabled and that the right host name is configured. The ingress class annotation indicates what ingress controller will be used for this ingress. And since we enabled TLS for Kicklock, we will set the backend protocol to HTTPS. The ingress will also use TLS, so we enable it and configure the host and certificate information. And then for persistence, we can enable Postgres to be installed alongside our Kicklock instance. We can now install using this Helm command. If we set things up correctly, we should be able to access Kicklock in the web browser. So now that we have a running Kicklock server, we need to configure the OpenID Connect protocol and create some users and groups. After we log in with the admin user we created during the installation, the first thing we need to do is to create a new realm so that we can have our Kubernetes configuration separate from the master. So now under the Kubernetes realm, we can create a new client from this client section. So typically we create a new client for each application that we want to provide authentication for. And in this case, the application is the Kubernetes cluster. So we'll set the client type to open ID connect, and then we can set the name and then the client ID as well. And then on the next page, we can turn on client authentication and set standard flow and direct access grants under authentication flow. And finally, we can set HTTP local host on port 8000 under valid redirect URIs and save the new client. So we set this URI because the Kube login plugin starts a web server on the user's machine at localhost 8000. And this is where the IDP redirects the user to after a successful authentication. We'll see how this works in a minute. Also take note of the client secret under the credentials tab. We will need this later. Under client scopes, we can configure the claims we want as part of the ID token that is sent back to the Kubernetes cluster. Now, these claims contain information which can include the user's email and a list of groups or memberships that the user is a part of 
that the Kubernetes API server will use to grant access to the cluster. So here we ensure that we have email and groups claims added. You will need to first create the group scope under client scopes before adding it here. So now let us create a new user and a group. First we create the k8admins group. Then we create an admin user from under the users tab. Set the username and email and set the email verified to yes. Then we can set the appropriate group membership and click create. Then once the user is created, we can then set the password under credentials. If your user information is maintained elsewhere, like on an LDAP server, you can pull that information into Keycloak using user federation. With that, we now have our IDB configured with the minimum required settings, and we can move on to configuring the Cube API server in the cluster we wish to provide authentication for. So when we list the pods in the Cube system namespace, we see here I have two Cube API server pods. I can describe one of them and take a closer look at the current configuration. So here, two bits of information are important for us. The first has to do with the host parts that are mounted into the pod, and one of them is the CSRT's host path. This is the path on the node where we will drop the CS certificate we used earlier to sign the key clock server certificate. I can do that right now by retrieving the certificate data from the secret in the key clock namespace. And then after SSHing into the first Cube API server node, I can create a new CSRT file and paste the contents of the CS certificate. The second bit of important information we will get from describing the Cube API server pod are the flags with which the Cube API server is configured. This is the configuration that we will need to update in order to enable OpenID Connect authentication. So while still logged into the node, we can change into the etc Kubernetes manifest directory and edit the Cube API server.yaml file, which is the configuration for the Cube API server pod running on that node. We can append the following OIDC flags to the existing configuration like this. We can configure the issuer URL, which is the URL to our key clock server, and then the client ID. We set the username claim to email, which means that the authenticating users will be identified by the email attribute. We also set the group's claim, and then finally the CS certificate path we copied over in the previous step. When we save the manifest file, the Cube API server pod will be recreated with a new configuration. We can also verify that the configuration took effect by describing the pod. These steps will of course need to be configured on all control plane nodes with Cube API server pod. So at this point we have successfully installed an identity provider using Keycloak. We have configured an OpenID Connect client, created an admin group and user, and finally we just reconfigured the API server to be able to connect to Keycloak. So next we need to install the kube login kubectl plugin, which I can do with this brew install command. You can check out the kube login GitHub project for more ways to install and use. So once kube login is installed, we can create a new user, which we can do with kubectl config set credentials. In this command, we set the kube login arguments that will be supplied to the kubectl command. Now, if you're not familiar with the kubectl plugin mechanism, this is where you're able to add functionality to the kubectl command with other scripts or plugins. For example, in this case, kubelogin installs an executable file named kubectl oidc login in your path. So if you run kubectl oidc login, you can now use the kubelogin plugin to authenticate with an oidc provider. So what we're doing here is using kube login to request for a token from Keycloak when we attempt to access the cluster with kubectl. So once the IDP receives the request, the user is directed to the IDP's login page via a web browser where they can log in with a username and password. And once the user is successfully authenticated, they receive an ID token which kubectl sends as part of the authorization request to the kube API server. This token is also saved on the user's machine so that Cube Login does not have to request for a new token from the IDP each time a request to the Cube API server is made. At this point, the Cube API server will check with the IDP to ensure that the ID token is valid and not expired. 
when the id token is verified the authentication part of the process is considered successful and this is where we move on to the authorization part so we will see how to configure authorization with rule-based access controls in a bit so moving on we see all the relevant idb configuration like the issuer the client id the client secret as well as the scopes that provide identifying information about the user once this user is set we can set it as the default user for the current context now we can test the authentication by simply issuing any kubectl command this will open up the keyclock login page in a browser where we can log in with our credentials and after a successful authentication our request is then sent to the kube api server but at this point we do not yet have any access to the cluster as you can see from this error saying that we do not have the appropriate rbac permissions configured so let us grant access to our admin user by creating a cluster role binding we can bind the inbuilt kubernetes cluster admin role to a subject of kind user and then set the username to the admin user's email let us edit our context again and switch back to the original user and apply this cluster role binding then we can switch back to the oidc user and try to access the cluster once more and now we can say that we have access to our cluster if you want to provide access based on the group then you'll need to create a cluster role binding and set the group information under subjects like this you can now create more fine-grained roles or cluster roles and grant or revoke access to your clusters. So since everyone accessing your cluster now has clear identifiers like email and group information, you may also want to log requests to the Kubernetes API server and get better visibility into the actions being performed on your cluster. So to do this, we need to enable audit logging on the Kube API server. Let us SSH back into the control plane node where we will need to edit the Kube API server manifest once more. But before we do that, let us first create an audit policy directory and within the same directory, create an example pod policy. So you can read more about Kubernetes auditing, the audit API version and how you can create your own audit policies in the official documentation. For now, I'll create a simple policy which logs requests made to the pods resource. Let us save that and edit the Kube API server manifest file. First, under volumes, I will add a host path for where the API server will write the audit logs. Then another host path for the directory where we store all our policies. Then we create the respective volume mounts for both directories. Then we enable audit logging with the audit log cube API server flag and set both the path for the logs and the policy files. We can now save the manifest file and wait for the cube API server to restart. Once restarted, we can tail the audit log file and issue a kubectl request. So now we can see the event logged by the API server and we see the username of the initiator, the action performed and where it was performed. So at this point, you have a basic authentication and authorization system for your Kubernetes clusters. You can, of course, customize this configuration more to fit your specific needs. And these same concepts can be used with any identity provider that supports OpenID Connect. I'll have the GitHub repo with the commands and manifest files linked in the description, as well as a readme file with step-by-step -step instructions. Thank you again for watching. And if you'd like to support the channel, please like this video and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.